Okay, so my story, I'm not going to go into it too much, but I was a marketer and a PR consultant, um, and then I had a career change to become a photographer, and I built one of the leading uh, wedding photography studios in Ireland. Let me tell you a little bit about my story around this subject, um, and I've got to be honest with you, this is something that I feel incredibly passionate about. Uh, Work-life balance, running an efficient business, it's so, so, so important. Um, when I first became a photographer, I used my marketing skills to build a business really, really fast. So then all this work starts coming in, and then how the heck do you kind of stay on top of it? At the time I was single, so there wasn't too much of an issue, and I just worked flat the mat, you know, morning to night. Um, I didn't actually get to see my friends too often because I was shooting weddings every weekend, and when I wasn't doing weddings, I was editing into the night every single evening. Then uh, I met my wonderful and beautiful wife, Margaret, um, and I think it was our third date uh, where we watched a movie while I sat there and edited, edited a wedding. Um, romantic, right? But at the same time, for some reason, she, she stayed around. Uh, but I would say it was probably a year into the relationship um, that, that Margaret kind of gave me a reality check one time. Um, you know, she explained to me that it wasn't normal to be working like a dog constantly at morning to night every single day. Um, and also, um, I'm sure many of you have got to the point when you've been sitting editing late at night at your desk and you kind of thought, it's a shame, right? That we are there taking photos of our clients of the most incredible occasions that they will ever experience in life. And yet, we aren't really experiencing that rich um, and the fullness of life because we're constantly stuck behind a computer if we're not out shooting. Uh, many of you will know that the photography part of a photography business is a very, very small fraction. You know, the marketing, the finance, the, the staffing, the editing, you know, all that sort of stuff is actually a huge part of what you do in a photography business and photography is, is the smallest little part. I'd like to uh, take a little quote from Jerry Johannes, and I had the honor to actually interview Jerry Johannes for Photo Professional Magazine last year. Um, and Jerry shared with me uh, some thoughts on work-life balance and how he approaches it. He said, Melissa and I just love what we do. Having work-life balance has been very important for us. At six in the evening, we both stop working, and at weekends when we're not shooting a wedding, we don't work. Just having the time off allows us to be refreshed and enjoy other parts of our life. The next morning, we are very excited to get back into work as we are refreshed and ready to do so. Melissa and I are both very naturally motivated. We go out there and we do the best that we can. That's incredible, you know, because think about it, right? You can't be the best photographer and you can't reach your potential if you're absolutely knackered, if you're constantly working, um, if you're just kind of under a pile of everything. And uh, that's something Jerry and I did discuss as well. You know, it's important to fill up your, uh, your well of creativity, let's say. And the only way that you can do that is to go out there and be inspired, you know. And I'm a big believer in that. Go for a date with your wife, go to the cinema, read a book. You go for a run, whatever it may be, whatever inspires you, you know, it's really, really important that you do that. Okay, so I want you to be honest with me right now. Do you have a problem? Um, and many of us out there really do have a problem when it comes to this issue. Here's how to identify if you do, right? You work long hours, late nights and weekends, and for wedding photographers, I know that's, that's all part of it, right? You're missing out on your family life, you're not having a life outside of running your photography business. And the amount of time and effort you put into your business is not reflective in the amount of revenue it's generating. I want you to be really, really honest with yourself. And if one of these issues is a, is a problem, you know, it's, it's not about admitting it to us or admitting it to other people in the community. It's just about recognizing that you have a problem. Okay, so I'm excited to share with you 12 hacks that have helped me to hack uh, this problem of efficiency and work-life balance. And I promise you, start using some of these hacks that are gonna help you to really start moving forward and improving your life. So, number one, it's all about prioritizing your work schedule. Let's have a look at how to do that. Um, on a weekly and then a daily basis, you should begin writing a list of to-do to tasks that need to be completed. 
It should be kept up to date uh, as tasks and new deadlines are added to your schedule. A good tip is to mark each deadline on a calendar so that you don't miss it and it will guide you when you get overwhelmed with the volume of work and do not know where to begin. When tasks are completed, you can then remove them from your list to build motivation and focus. Uh, we use a system called Teamwork. Uh, I know there's others out there called uh, Basecamp and there's a, there's, a range of different, um, there's a range of different tools that can do this for you. Um, the good thing about having something like Teamwork, especially if you have um, multiple people that are involved within your business, is that everything is kept together in one place. So it's really, really simple to understand what everybody else is doing within the business. I just want to share with you a little bit of information about the important and urgency matrix. And um, sometimes this is actually a very useful tool to sit down and, and chart out the activities that you're doing on this matrix. So, um, a technique uh, that I mentioned, um, it's a powerful way of thinking about priorities and use the matrix so you can identify those tasks that are the most important and shift your focus to completing them rather on a, than on the tasks that feel urgent, but really in essence they're not important. So I want you guys to put together your to-do list, get together everything that you have to do and plot these tasks on this matrix, okay? Remembering that the definition for importance on this scale is not how important the task is to you achieving your strategies and, or objectives, okay? So make sure that it, it's in relation to your strategies and, and objectives. If you don't have strategies and objectives, you need to get those in place as well, okay? Um, if your task is of high importance and in the high urgency quarter, then it will be in the top of your list, okay? So if it's high importance and then high on urgency, these are things that you need to do right now, okay? The tasks that fall into the uh, low importance and low urgency quadrant are called distractions. And again, think about those distractions. These are tasks that should be avoided at all costs. They don't add value to your business and use up the time spent on important or urgent tasks that really, really need to be done. When planning your to-do list, you need to be realistic about the length of time that's required for the task to be completed. And it's good practice to allow for contingency time in case of unforeseen issues. Okay, so have a think about the important urgency matrix. There's a lot of information online about this uh, system for trying to understand what you actually should be doing. So some of you will have heard me talk about this before, but I love the, the book and the concept behind Eat That Frog. Okay, so the idea behind Eat That Frog is if you have a task that you really, really don't wanna do, and on the first day, it's just like a tiny, tiny, tiny little frog. Um, and if you do that task on the day, it's just like eating that frog. Um, the way it goes, okay? Uh, if you don't do that task, the next day it grows a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and eventually it's a huge, big, slimy toad uh, that you really, really, it's not very appetizing to eat, right? So, eat that frog. Every day when you start your day, pick the thing that's horrible, the thing you really don't want to do, that call to the client to say, whatever it may be, okay, the thing you're dreading, do it first, okay? Get it out of the way. Uh, and this is a, such a good thing because for me, if there's something that I know I really need to do and I don't do it and days go by, like it's just on my mind and um, it's very, very hard to get on and put focus into other things if you're constantly worried about this thing that you're supposed to do. And maybe it's three, four weeks since you were supposed to do that and it just feels impossible to tackle. So eat that frog, hack two. Hack three, batch. It's really important to batch together the tasks that you need to do. So we used to offer um, CD packages along with uh, a disc. I know that is totally obsolete right now, right? But if you're doing a USB and you're providing those to your clients, for example, um, you may want to do them once a month or once every couple of weeks rather than doing them as you need them. And this can really, really speed you up. So look at your business and look at what you can batch in order to kind of speed up those processes. Hack for distractions. Learning to ignore distractions when you're completing a task is a major issue and it really, really affects your productivity. There are many sources of distractions in the workplace from emails, call, the calls, the internet, colleagues, and either and also other tasks. We actually work here at Engage Live in a co-working space. Um, and we're working today with the guys from the co-working space who are helping us to film the webinar today. Uh, but at times it can become very distracting in a co-working space and environment like that because there's a lot going on. Um, and if you're like me, you're kind of a little bit nosy, it's kind of hard not to overhear conversations and to kind of get involved with what's going on in the office. And that's all good, but, but it can be very distracting. 
So there's a number of things um, that I would suggest that can, can really, really help with, uh, with minimizing your distractions. Um, and we're going to talk about those right now. So hack five, let's talk about how to deal with your email. And, and this is uh, such a big issue for many, many, many people. Um, the first thing I would do is turn off the notifications. So when you get an email, if you get a ping or a notification on the desktop, you really need to turn that off because you're constantly going to be going in and out of email, answering inquiries, when that's not an efficient way to run your business at all. Set specific times when you're going to check your emails and respond during that time. Um, it's a really good time to set these uh, at a time of the day when you feel you're least productive. So it can be used to sort of as a break from another task. Um, to stick to these times, make sure to close your email as well. So don't have your email constantly open throughout the day. If you're going in and out, dipping in and out of your emails, it's a really inefficient way to deal with your email. Um, if there's an instance that a reply will take a reasonable time, then schedule it into your task list instead of overrunning the allowed time that you're going to set aside to answer emails. So let's say you say to yourself, right, 10 minutes or 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon, that's when you're going to deal with email. And outside of that, close your email, don't answer it, um, you know, don't be kind of attracted to kind of constantly be checking your phone. It's really important uh, if you want to be efficient in how you're running your business. Um, I've crafted a list of killer email responses, um, which basically deal with the most common responses that you that you would have for a client. I speak to so many photographers, and I work with quite a few who um, basically are, are running businesses, which are perhaps not the most efficient way to do it. Um, if you're if this is how you're de dealing with email, this is wrong. So if you're getting an email, you're writing a fresh reply, and you're hitting send. That's not the way to do it. Okay. The way to do it um, is to have your, your emails listed out in a template format, okay? Think of the things that you're constantly getting emailed about. So for example, I have an email, first of all, for inquiries, which, in, which we require some information. So that's people who uh, have said, hey, can you do my wedding? Well, obviously I need to know the date, we need a location. And then we have um, an email which deals with our general inquiry email. Almost every single thing that you can think of that people email us about, we have a response to deal with it. So you've got a list of all the emails that you might require. It means that when you get an email, all you have to do is just change the subject line and maybe uh, maybe some other details within the email and send it off. Um, so yeah, that's the fastest way, uh, the most efficient way to deal with your emails. Hack six, internet. Minimizing the distraction on the internet is much, much harder, uh, especially as it's so widely used in so many business tasks, including social media marketing, it takes discipline to focus on a task at hand. And there are some really cool apps you can download to help you to manage that process. Uh, if you find that you're constantly on the internet, constantly dipping in and dipping out of Facebook and social media, think about downloading Rescue Time. It can actually shut down your internet connection. Uh, so if you've been surfing the internet for too much on that day, uh, it's going to shut down your, your connection and you're going to have to uh, basically get on with what you're supposed to be doing instead of watching videos on the net. Okay, unless it's our videos, of course, that engage. Hack seven, take a break. Um, and it's really, really important to schedule regular breaks throughout your day. Uh, I'd love to chat to you a little bit about the Pomodoro technique, um, which is a technique that I heard about from Matt Kennedy, uh, and it's something that I've implemented into my business. So um, I've got a short video uh, of a Skype that I had with Matt Kennedy, which was part of the business plan uh, course. Uh, that you can also check out on Engage. So uh, Matt's going to explain a little bit about the technique and then I'll touch base with you in regards to how I've used the Pomodoro technique as well. I mean, from the outset at that point, I mean, obviously at that point you have been running your business for a number of years. So you probably made a lot of mistakes, I guess, and like most of us have done, and you probably figured out a lot of stuff by the time you were ready to go full time. Um, yeah. my, my question is, because definitely I see you as one of these people who's re running a really efficient photography business um, yeah. so from that point you know were you putting those systems in place or you know was that something you just kind of learned over time or how did you get to a point where you were like for example we'll talk more about outsourcing and things like that can yeah. you explain that process yeah we um the first time that we really woke up to like okay now you're running a business and you need to be efficient because efficiency means more money per hour um we, we realized that when we went to WPPI for the first time, um, which is the WPPI Wedding Portrait 
and photographers, wedding wedding and portrait photographers international. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a conference in Vegas every year. Uh, the first year that we went to it, uh, Carissa and I went off on like different streams, like different uh, courses, uh, workshops, the, the, almost the whole time. There was only like two that we went to that were the same because we were so strategic of thinking like we need to get as much information as we can and then come together and tell each other about it. We both came back with like binders full of stuff saying like this is what we need to do. And so that that year, which was which was right before or right of the year of our first year, um, we were like, okay, this makes sense. Like all of these things that we're hearing makes total sense and now we need to actually do it rather than just know about it. Um, so again, to her strengths, she she was getting the administration of our business down and said, okay, here are the steps that we're going to take. Here's how we're going to take them. Here's what you do. Here's what I do. And we just started cranking on them and started started making them happen. And we noticed a huge change in our family life was the biggest thing. Um, most of the things that we learned were not, here's how to make more money, but it was, here's how to get your life back and how to systemize so that you're not wasting your time. Um, one of the biggest things that we learned was that we are only paid for times where our clients can physically see us because they have no idea how much time we're spending on anything. And so it doesn't matter if we spent one hour or 10 hours on something, that doesn't make us more money. It may make the product better or worse, um, but the, uh, maybe you can help me with this, what's the, the the law of diminishing returns, I think. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the more you spend, the more time you spend on something, the less return that you get for the amount of time that you spent on it. So you could spend an hour and get it great, or you could spend 10 hours and get it really great, but nobody can tell the difference between great and really great. Um, so you have to be able to get it to the point that you're comfortable with it and you're confident with putting out your quality of work or, or whatever else it is that you're, you're, you're talking about. Um, but you got to also remember that at some point you need to say, okay, it's done and move on uh, and become efficient with a system that helps you do that. Uh, so that was one of the hugest things that helped us was at WPPI learning, learning some strategies about uh, organizing our, our business with our email, with our contracts, um, with questionnaires, uh, lots of that kind of stuff that makes things automatic. Um, so that we don't have to always be, you know, on email all the time with our clients all the time, um, because that was taking up a lot of time. Absolutely. And you know what, I think that that actually improves the client's experience as well. Um, yeah. You know, so it's kind of win-win, I think, actually, for, for both parties. Just talking about efficiency again, I was going to chat to you about this little thing, which is the Pomodoro. And yeah. um, I guess I, I kind of read that this is one of the techniques that you use or that you have utilized. Um, and I uh, wonder if you get, give guy, everybody out there just kind of an idea of what this is because I read about this that you were doing this. I started to do this and uh, it really, really helped me actually to be a little bit more efficient. Good. Uh, and there's an app. That's the one that I use. <laughs> I've got this. I'm old school. That looks cool. I like that. <laughs> it's a made-up timer. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can do it and there are lots of... Uh, lots of numbers that people will say are best, um, but basically the Pomodoro technique is to have a set amount of time that you're working on something, and then have a set amount of time that you're not working on something, and to uh, to take some time. There's a, there's a few things that work into this that that really help. Um, what I usually try to do is uh, 40 minutes on, and then 10 minutes off, um, and with a little bit of leeway. Um, but the 40 minutes on, I try to have as a time. Um, and so the reason for that, and there's again, there's lots of people that will say 20 minutes is best, 70 minutes is best. Um, I've just found 40 minutes is great because that's usually how much time it takes me to do certain tasks that I want to do. And if I know that I can turn off all other things and just focus on one thing and do it for 40 minutes, I can do a great job of it. Uh, if I finish it early, I stop early and I... Do my, do my break early, get a longer break or whatever. Um, but essentially having set times where you work on one thing and then stand up, walk around, uh, 
go and get your kids some food. Like, there's so many things that you can do in the time off that re-energizes you so that when you get back onto doing it, you're back and focused and, and attentive. Um, the two things that I would say are important is reducing distractions, so turning off other programs, especially Facebook, um, and, and even on your phone so it doesn't just pop up and give you messages all the time. Um, so turning off other things, getting rid of other distractions, and then being really attentive to the one thing that you're doing. Um, so take away distractions and really be attentive to one thing that you're doing. Uh, that's going to allow you to do a better job of those things, a faster job of those things, and it gives you motivation to get it done if you have a time that's coming. Um, so a lot of times, if, as long as I'm not writing something, I'll have music on that is loud enough that I can't hear other things that are really going on. As long as I'm not supposed to be looking after kids, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, that's how I do it. And it, it helps so much to be able to be efficient and you feel better after you've done it. And uh, yeah, one, one thing I actually found when I started to do it was I realized how much I actually check social media. Um, yeah. because after a few minutes I started to think I wonder if anybody's liked that photograph or commented or you know so it's kind of good focus your mind a little bit okay so it's really interesting to hear what Matt had to say and the Pomodoro technique you you can actually buy a book and you get a timer with it right or you can download the app and obviously that's the most uh, much better way to do it um, but the concept is that you you time you do you work only in one thing for a certain amount of minutes uh, and then after that you take a short break and after every four of those pomodoros as they're called uh, you take a longer break as well the thing that really astounded me when i started trying out the pomodoro technique is actually how easily distracted i get and after a few minutes i was thinking I wonder if anybody's liked my Facebook page or left a comment or I wonder if anybody sent me an email. I mean, just try it yourself. Just try and concentrate. I think it's 20-something um, it's 20, 20 minutes that you just have to concentrate on one thing and it's actually really, really hard. Um, but it's a great way to discipline your mind and really get you more focused on what you're doing. Okay, so hack eight, the 80-20 principle or 20-80 principle. Um, you can keep redrafting work until it's perfect but at that time, it's probably better spent working on a new task. Uh, for the perfectionist, this will be hard to comprehend as you're compromising quality, but the 80-20 principle describes where 80% of the output took about 20% of the effort, then the remaining 20% of the output can only be achieved by putting in 80% of the effort. This prevents you from failing to meet deadlines and encroaching into time allocated to other tasks. Um, so. You know, just get, get it to the point when you're happy uh, and, and then move it forward, move on to the next task, okay? Customer workflow, hack nine. When it comes to meeting deadlines in a photography business, there are none more important than in the customer workflow. This is a list of activity which must be completed in a particular order uh, in order to take your customer from the booking stage to receiving their images. When you manage your customer workflow, effectively your business will be more efficient and you'll be able to handle more work. The customer experience will also be more professional, which impacts on your reputation and your referrals. Uh, a really great tool is Light Blue, and we do have a class dedicated to using Light Blue uh, here on Engage. So make sure to go and pick that up uh, and download the software as well. It's just an incredible piece of software which will revolutionize what you do within your photography business. Um, I just want to show you one of the things that we do in Light Blue, which is our customer workflow. So, We've charted out absolutely everything that we do within our photography business. So for example, if somebody books with us a certain number of days after, uh, we'll carry out a particular task and likely provides reminders to ensure that our customer experience is completely um, consistent and to, of a high quality as well. So think about your, your workflow, it's really, really important. Um, I know there's a number of tools out there as well. Zach and Judy Gray have just launched ShootFlow, um, which does something similar to Light Blue, but it contains a lot of information like uh, you know, invoice sheets and di different things that you may want to send your client as well. Certainly we use Light Blue, it's a fantastic tool and I can't recommend it highly enough. Hack 10, Streamline. Streamlining processes within your business uh, is really, really important. If you actually sit down and work out the workflow of how you do something, often you realize that a couple of those things that you do can either be done in a different order or perhaps those things can actually be eliminated altogether. So 
uh, look at streamlining the business. We have a webinar on here called Customer Experience at Rocks that talks you through in an hour exactly how I did that for my business. So make sure to check that out and go through that process of streamlining. It's really, really important. Hack 11, automate. Um, we're looking into a piece of software at the moment called Infusionsoft for Engage. Um, and what that will enable us to do is if somebody contacts the business, um, it will automatically send them an email and then X amount of days after they'll get another email. Like the whole process is automated. Look at your business, think about where you can automate process. Again, back to Light Blue, we did talk about Light Blue previously, um, but we're able through Light Blue to actually send an invoice to your client from the system and it keeps everything together um, within Light Blue so you have all that information there. Your client can get the invoice, select the package that they want to go for, and they can actually make payment all online. So that automates a process which could potentially um, be quite a lengthy and time consuming process. We love SurveyMonkey as well, and it's one of the tools that we use within, uh, within our business. Um, and we have a number of surveys that we give to our wedding clients in order to gather all the information for the wedding. Before we did that, we sat down with each client for an hour to go through the whole process. And again, that was just a very, very lengthy, lengthy process. So where you can automate, really, really consider uh, automating for your business. Hack 12, our last hack here today, uh, outsource. Um, I believe that you should work to your strengths and fill those gaps where you're not as strong. So for me, I outsource my financial management and I outsource my editing. I've also got an assistant, Tom, who's now actually an associate here within the business, who takes care of, care of a range of tasks, um, which free me up to get on with the activities that are going to generate revenue. Um, during the stages of the customer workflow, there may be elements that you're not proficient in, or if you don't have the time to complete those things, um, it's important to think about getting some help. And these instance, instances, you can outsource them to specialist companies, um, but this does increase your outgoing costs. Consider it as a fixed cost and make sure to charge for it. Outsourcing my editing, I'm going to talk about right now, has really freed me up to do everything that I've done over the last couple of years. So let's look at shoot.edit. Uh, fast is best, they're the outsourcing um, company of choice for, for my business. Um, and the, we are shooting around 50 weddings a year, which are outsourced to shoot.edit. Um, I can pretty much edit a wedding pretty quick now, I'd say maybe a day, and I know other people are doing it in a few hours. Other people are spending 30 to 40 hours to edit a wedding. It's a complete no-brainer to have somebody else to, uh, to outsource to, um, to do all the editing for your weddings. That means that you're freed up to do activities which will generate revenue in your business. Because the truth is, if you're behind your computer, if you're editing, you're not being profitable. And at the end of the day, if you actually worked out for the average photographer, how much they're getting paid for that time that they sit in front of the computer editing, they'd be better off working at McDonald's. So um, I definitely am a huge advocate of outsourcing. Think of a shoot.edit. Uh, they do a free trial as well. I think we can hook you guys up with that in the engagers group on Facebook. Make sure to add us and we'll get you in there. Queensbury with their service, they, they, they are who we use for our wedding albums. Um, and they actually handle all of the album design. Um, so it means that we're not having to kind of take that process on board as well. And the designs that they bring back are just fantastic. They look amazing. So, you know, think about outsourcing areas of your business, such as album design, such as outsourcing. Things that you don't necessarily need to do, things that aren't going to increase your profit in your business. And put your time, put your effort into sales, marketing, driving your business forward, improving your craft. And these are the things which are going to really make you stand out in the, uh, uh, among the competition. Okay, so uh, final thoughts, supercharging workflows by creating processes and templates for actions you would take on a regular basis. Make sure that you've organized your workspace as, okay, sorry, I'm gonna start that again, okay. Okay, so some final thoughts. Uh, supercharge your workflows by creating processes and templates for actions you take on a regular basis. Make sure that you've got an organized workplace and studio. This is kind of a no-brainer. Buy yourself a label machine. It's like so therapeutic, like label everything. So if you've got somebody coming in to work with you in your business, they can find whatever they need. We have a drawer in the office called Sticky Stuff and nobody's ever wondering where the tape is. It's always in the Sticky Stuff drawer. Um, so think about labeling things. It's always a good idea. Um, this is gonna save you a lot of time in searching for information and resources. 
Um, and definitely think about things like that you can do within your business and implement, please implement these 12 hacks into your business and into your life. You, your family, your customers, your friends will thank you for implementing these 12, uh, 12 hacks into your business. A final thought from Jasmine Starr. Jasmine says she has an overall global to-do list. She says this is where I list my workflow, every detail, every project, every step in the project. I also have a daily to-do list because it's easy to feel very overwhelmed by looking at the long list of things to do and then my daily to-do list is simply me writing down 8 to 10 things that I need to get done that day. And it's so amazing if you list 10 things that you need to get done that day, you actually get them done. Productivity for me is just a matter of making a big list and then making a daily list that helps me get through the day. My bum cannot leave the seat until I am finished with everything. It forces you not to be on social media very much because you're just like I need to get my work done, right? Uh, I need to get, uh, to get it to my clients. My husband and I have open conversations about work. We both work and live together and it's easy to let your work life get in the way of your personal life. We have discussions, but after I close my computer at 6.30 every day, we don't talk about work. I work from 6 a.m. in the morning till 6.30 p.m. and anything beyond that is our time. It's a big thing. So I have to be productive in the hours that I'm working or else I won't be able to spend time with my husband and my dog and that's my top priority.